We're very, very proud to have Manchi speak to us tonight. He's the third time president of the Building Officials Association, so he's well connected with what goes on in the building. He knows code, he's been at this game for 25 years. But he just, just recently crossed over the dark side from his inspection in Langley, Abbotsford, North Vancouver City, City and now Cove. District Cove. West Vancouver, he's now crossed over the dark sector, which is the private sector. So he'll be very free to speak, because I'm sure he will now as a vice president of a construction company. Manji, it's a real pleasure to have you speak to us tonight on secondary suites and the implications to you as mechanicals and to the builders you're working for. Nail him with all the questions you can think of. He's good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the uh, invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and, uh, and my honor to come in and have a discussion. I'm not sure if I can call myself an expert, but I, uh, we can have a discussion at least. If, if not a resolution, at least uh, confuse you a little bit more than what we've done with it. The secondary suite topic, and, and David and I talked about this back in 2001 that maybe one of these days we should do a presentation together and David taught me the uh, uh, eating ventilation course uh, so finally after about 15 16 years we made it <laughs> thank you uh, and this topic came uh, when David uh, was at our uh, spring uh, uh, conference uh, in, 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 uh, in us, uh, May this year and we was talking about a secondary suites and we had a conversation. He said, would you be interested to come in and talk about it? I said, Absolutely. Uh, and so here we are. In between questions and in between interrupt, whenever you need to ask questions, ask clarification, and I'll try to answer as many as I can, as much as I know. <clears throat> I'm not an expert in the heating ventilation end of it. Uh, I, I'm qualified from building end of it, uh, an RBO, which is a registered building official. This is the uh, highest title that uh, you can have in our association. I'm also a CRBO, uh, Canadian registered building official, meaning if I wanted to transfer my credentials from here to Ontario, other than some, uh, some upgrades, local upgrades, I could do that. So that's where the National Association comes in. And our sort of national association agenda is, if I can say a couple of things, it's called ACWA, Alliance of Canadian Building Officials Association, is to bring consistency at least at high level. I'm not talking at a ground level, at uh, a granular level, high level can, uh, through other provinces. So if you decide to pull up our stakes here to go to Alberta, if economy is good, at least there's a similar standards are being applied. And uh, we are looking at from the building inspections end of it, if things slow down in the BC, you want it to move somewhere else. So, so there's a, a transferability or a mobility of a trade, what it's called. Uh, I think that was brought in by Tilma, transfer of an intermobility act, then and it was taken over by New West Partnership Agreement, which is between BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, meaning if you're a qualified trade in the BC, you can take that into Alberta. You should have no real problems working there, and then you can move all over them to Saskatchewan. So, from a, a national point of view, that's what we try doing: is bringing some consistency, some education, and our training. And so, today's topic was uh, secondary suites versus duplexes, because the two units. What's the difference between those two? And then we can talk a little bit about what are the when you, from your point of view, when you're looking at it. And I try focusing in in the thing is that you'll probably be interested and, and we can talk a little bit more. Ask questions from your local municipality's point of view. If you have a legal switch, we do this, why we do it. I'll try answering from technical end of it. And there's a, some aspects where that are unique to your municipality, which I may not know. There are land use regulatory processes, so we can go through that. History of a secondary suites. Basically, secondary suites have been non-existing forever. <coughs> they started from a university towns. You create a little uh, bachelor pad, and kid wanted to go to university, save some money rather than going to res. You want an independent thing. Rent a room. Room got a little bigger. 
had a bathroom with it, bathroom got a little bit bigger, wanted a kitchen or a hot plate or something, now becoming an independent suite. So they're not new. They're not new to the uh, uh, to our building construction in our North America, in, uh, in uh, Canada and the U.S. Both. There sometimes you see more, in some towns you see less. Economy, uh, economies of houses sort of a plays a role in it, and you could see two suites in. That's not they're not legal though, but you do see them. <coughs> and suites were given many names: nanny suite, nala suite or other variations that you might see and, and a, a, or, or a summer kitchen or some are summer kitchen by true nature the others are just another way to do a suite so that's sort of uh, what uh, in, in a suite are called <clears throat> prior to 1996 suites were recognized by code there was nothing in a building code that you can build a secondary suite uh, you could make a duplex out of it. You can build that as a duplex. But duplex, as you know, have a, uh, and we'll, which you'll see, are different kind of requirements. They are the kind of two independent units and some of its own little uh, quirky little things that you need to do with them. <coughs> so prior to 1996, there was really nothing in the code that uh, you can say, if I wanted to have a suite in my house, what do I need to do? Well, I don't know. Duplex? Eh, it's not really a duplex. What should I do? I don't know. Maybe just, just go ahead and do it. We'll see what happens. <laughs> That's how we have been doing. Because uh, some municipalities will take a stand and say, no, you can't do it. And I turn around and go ahead and do it anyways. And that's how they've been running around. In October 1996, building code got amended. And building code recognized a suite, a secondary suite. It's uh, regulated. If there's a requirement in it, how it need to, what are the requirements need to be, what it looks like, what it feels like, what would you do, how would you do, and so on and so forth. So from October 1996, some municipalities uh, looked at that by uh, the, the code change and took advantage of it. And I was in the city of Abbotsford at that time. Our manager and our council mandate was that. Now you have a regulation. Let's see how we can legalize the switch. And building code looks at it. Primary function is uh, health, uh, safety, and protection of a property. That's all the code wants you to do. We want to make sure that you're safe in the house. Your things should things happen. You can get out, and your family can get out. Can you save a house? Probably not. But at least you are uh, safe. So that's those requirements came in in 1996. So what is it? <coughs> what do you think is a secondary suite? What's your definition of a secondary suite? If you haven't <laughs> <laughs> Extra, extra income. <laughs> extra income, that's absolutely right. Extra income is one of the ways to defining it. In, uh, I mean, if you're in this part of the town and, you know, small little shack costs you about a, a million dollars, then now you need to figure it out. You need about a 25% now. That's a quarter of a million dollars. Then $750,000. Now you do need to make a payment. You might put a one or two. Sometimes people have done two, but legally there's only one per minute. So secondary suite has few things that it, it will, if you put few things together, then it will become a secondary suite. Just because you have a place in your basement doesn't make it make it secondary suite. Having a total floor space of not more than 90 square meters. And, and the highlighted 90 square meters. Uh, just keep that number in mind. will come up a few times. And there's a significance of that number. And, pardon? <laughs> uh, put on 970, 968. Uh, so 90 square meters, uh, 968 square feet. That's the maximum size of a suite you can have. But that's not the only thing, because there's a comma. There's probably something else coming after this. Having a floor space less than 40% of the habitable floor space of the building. 90 square meters, not more than 40%. Uh, 
So now there's a sort of a theme coming together. Doesn't matter how big your house is, you could have a house that's a 5,900 square feet. I'm still trying to keep it in the park line. <clears throat> and 40% of that is a huge, but code says 970 square feet, 968, that's all you can have. Okay. And, and now both of these numbers will play some role in as we start looking into secondary suites. Uh, some code regulations, some uh, uh, some requirements. Located within a building of a residential occupancy containing only one other dwelling unit. So, building is defined in a building code. This hotel is a one building. You have a probably 50, 60, 80, 100 units in it. There's a little restaurant, there's a little pub, meeting room. So there's lots of things happening in it. It's saying in a building, you have a one or another unit. <coughs> Meaning you have a house, dwelling unit, we'll define that. Then you can put a secondary suite. So now secondary suite is, only can be in a house, can only be 90 square meters, and not more than 40% of the total floor space of the house. And the garage sometimes gets, garage gets excluded if it's, even if it's attached because that's not habitable space per se. It's a storage of a vehicle and or uh, the junk that we can't put around your walls. And here's another important factor about a secondary suite. Located in and a part of a building which is a single real estate entity. And now, not more than 90 square meters, not more than 40%, in a residential occupancy, another building, and it's one legal single real estate entity. What does that mean? There's no two, there's no two land titles, it's one single land title. Absolutely. Does that exclude duplexes and you can't put a secondary suite in a duplex? That would be the differentiating of a, of a because the secondary suite would be to the duplex because it's the sec, the separate legal real estate entity, right? Yeah, absolutely right. A duplex can be strata. You can sell half of the duplex to one person and the other half to the other person. You can't do that with a, you can't sell a secondary suite. That's what I mean, part of the original. That it's part of a house, it's part of a building, and the duplex is in strata or non-strata, uh, mostly strata. That because that single real estate entity is a strata is defined as a single. So if you have it in a building, you have a duplex, and that sort of a causes it. So you can't have a secondary suite in a duplex. Having said this, there is a movement from national point of view. There is a movement coming from. Uh, <coughs> even affordability end of it. I wouldn't be surprised if a last statement gets changed in the last in the next four or five years. That's possible, but again, there, you hear some murmuring about it, some rumors about it that why not in the duplexes, what can we do? So our building inspectors in Surrey, especially, during the last is. Yeah. Why? And nobody's doing it. Like, I brought it up for the attention. Your, lo done, your local council. It's going to be like four suites in the basement. Yep. And they're turning a blind eye. Uh, are they turning a blind eye or are they told to turn a blind eye? It doesn't matter. It why doesn't matter. Why is a blind eye being turned to this? Could be political reasons. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. You know, it's it's a that's a very legitimate question, especially in a lower mainland. Surrey, I live in Abbotsford, Abbotsford, Coquitlam, uh, Burnaby, Richmond, New West, Vancouver. That's common, and some municipalities took a stance that we're going to be proactively enforce that. The others said, if it's not in your face, you leave it alone. Or prior to 1996, the because there was no regulatory regulation in the building code saying how we should treat secondary suites, most municipalities ignored them, or because they didn't know what to do with them, 
but there's a bigger social issue. You pull these people out of a secondary suite, they provide, I mean, used to provide, I don't know what they still do, it would be 1500 bucks for a secondary suite. Uh, they used to provide affordable housing. From, at some level, that might be an, an, a reason why they said, leave it alone. But from a building inspector's point of view, that's a political direction, could be an administrative direction, there could be a variety of reasons. I'm not sure what would be, be in Missouri, but if you're asked that the city's policy is this, and council adopted policy, public policy, and they have every right to do that. Make kind of sense? We talked to you in terms of the building unit, and I don't want to punch out of it because we all have kind of an idea, but it's still wanted to throw that out. <coughs> Means a suite operated as a housekeeping unit used or intended to be used by one or more persons for the usually containing cooking, eating, living, sleeping, and sanitary facilities. That's how the dwelling unit is defined. A house, now you can be a secondary, a house is a dwelling unit, a suite in it is a dwelling unit, and that sort of plays a role when we looked at uh, only other dwelling unit. That's why I threw that definition, so it sort of makes a little bit more sense where that's coming from. And another word that I've highlighted here is a suite. That's just a partial definition of a suite. Means a single room or series of rooms of uh, complementary use. It's an interesting word, complementary use, I don't know. Uh, from room to room. Uh, operated under a single tenancy and includes a dwelling unit. <coughs> suite talk, dwelling unit talks about a suite, suite talks about a dwelling unit. It's kind of like going around in a circle, but in order for it to make sense, you kind of have to include both of them. <coughs> Including guest rooms that are in a hotel, motel, boarding room, dorm houses, and a dormitory. So that's sort of a suite, dwelling unit, secondary suite, all kind of all sort of tied together. <coughs> That kind of making sense? Sort of, except they deviated from a part nine building in that suite definition when they're contradicted at the beginning. Pardon? Well, the, the, when they define suite, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and motels, hotels, and boarding houses wouldn't be a part nine building, right? No, nope, nope, because suite is goes into a your uh, penthouse as a suite. Okay. It's a little little misleading though by including the definition though, right? Uh, well, because suite also applies to, I left a partial definition. There's a lot more after it. It talks about uh, business occupancies, talks about industrial occupancies, because the suite is not a secondary suite. Suite of a series of rooms okay. are, are making a suite. And then dwelling unit is where you live. Suite could be your uh, office. That's a suite. Could be your uh, repair shop. You have an office, you have a little mezzanine washroom, you have a lunch room, then your repair shop. That's a suite itself. So suite doesn't mean it's a secondary suite. That's why there's a word on top of it. It's a secondary suite. So that's where that uh, that contradiction gets cleared. But what I didn't want to do was have, because it's about another four or five lines, I'm talking about other suites, and I don't want to get to that part of it. It's sort of confusing with that definition. But again, suite talks about a dwelling unit, dwelling unit talks about a suite, suite could be multiple things. Does that kind of make sense? Requirements for secondary suites. <coughs> There's two types of requirements that are coming to play for secondary suites. Land use and regulatory requirements. Technical and health and safety requirement. The first one is your zoning bylaw, your building bylaw, your uh, servicing bylaw, whatever your municipality decided to do, and what are the things that are gets regulated there, how many parkings you may need, you need to buy garbage stickers, you don't need to buy garbage stickers, you can have it in a cul-de-sac, not have it in a cul-de-sac, you can have it in this part of the town or not that part of the town. That's your local council decisions because that's what your citizens wanted, or at least your council thought that your citizens wanted 
So they're trying to address those issues. So this area may have that, may not, whatever, however they decide. Those are the first type of our regulations where some municipalities, they say, have to have three parking spaces, two for a house, one for a secondary suite, and the others are silent. The others will say, if it's a cul-de-sac, you can't have secondary suites in the lots fronting the bulb of a cul-de-sac. Practical reasons, you have a secondary suite, you have a narrow little driveway, you park on the road, fire truck can't turn around, garbage truck can't, can't turn around, so they decided, no, you're not going to allow that. And that's permiss permissibility. The second one is a building code, that's what we will be talking about. <coughs> and why do the requirements differ from one city to another? Common complaint from your point of view. Absolutely drive you nuts. Just to cross a white line and now you're in a different world. <coughs> it's dictated by the first line land use regulations. Most of us are driving, if you're not in, uh, in, in Tutia to the municipalities, dealing with the municipalities, you leave Vancouver and you wouldn't know by the time you hit Port Man that you have gone through five, six cities. Each have their own little government and each have their own little policies and each have little uh, requirements and that's where the differences come in. You know, this far side of the white line one requirement step here Something else applies because this council thinks, yeah, you can have more than four or five, we don't care. These guys say, no, 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 you can only have one. That's where that differentiation comes in. That drives you nuts because how do you know? Why is it this different than that? And same applies to, to a degree, to the technical requirements. In some municipalities, they wanted to be accommodating to have a suite. Back in 1996, when uh, suites were legalized in an Abbotsford, we <clears throat> the code called at that time. You have a fire separation exit. You do this and that and everything with it. You have to have a separate heating system, one in a suite, one in upstairs. And uh, we looked at it. Okay, find the regulation is in place. What is it that it's trying to do? Were we on our rights? Yeah, I think we were to a degree, because as a manager of that department, he was a chief building inspector and title of a chief building inspector, and he can make these adjustments as long as they're technically sound. So what he ended up doing, he looked at the separating the heating systems, and an average home would cost about $10,000. This is back in 1996. You may need to upgrade your uh, <coughs> electrical service. You may need to do the baseboard heating, and then you may need to rip out the ducting and put a new furnace in, so it's all independent, separate. So then we dug down a little bit deeper into why is it? Okay, we don't want smoke to go from one to the other. The smell, that's a lifestyle choice. Who are we to tell you what to do or not to do? You decide to put a suite in it, and two different cultures cooking in it and one can't bear the other, well, one can decide to leave. Who are we to say that you can't have it? But what's our motive is going back to health, life, and safety. So what we devised within the municipality under the guidance of uh, Tom Higgins, you know, he was a manager at that time, a brilliant, brilliant man, uh, that we will allow you to keep a single heating system, okay, provided you do certain things. Those things were, if you have a heating ducts, those are coming out of a suite, they're common, they're heating the suite, you need to put a fire dampers in, so you maintain your fire separation. Okay. And, uh, but by the time you're in November, December months, you have a fire in a suite or upstairs, the furnace is going, and it's spewing smoke one to the other, now you're causing property damage and or danger in someone's life. So what we looked at at that time is uh, if you have a smoke, you're putting a photoelectric smoke alarm, you put a relay switch to it. This is totally made in an Abbotsford solution for our requirement and our need that. 
So what that system did, and that's where the different requirements come in. <clears throat> if there's a smoke, uh, enough smoke for a smoke alarm to kick off, and your furnace is running, it'll cut off the relay switch, stop the furnace fan. The fan stops, the, uh, the burner stops by itself. That's how it's designed, and you guys know this, and I don't need to tell you that. And if there's enough fire in it, the fire dampers will close. So now, <clears throat> provided an early warning system to get people out. And we somewhat controlled the smoke migration from one to the other by stopping the active uh, uh, distribution of a smoke. And if there's enough heat to stop the heat from with a fire dampers. So that's probably not, an, uh, not a probably, it's not in the code, but it, from based on our experience, uh, uh, technical discussions, we were satisfied that this will be difficult. Again, to accommodate what we need to do. And some municipalities do a few other things, but again, those are what you want to do, what your city, your council, your senior management wanted to accomplish. And we were asked that without jeopardizing life safety of the people, what can we do? That's the solution. So that's why you see different requirements and in some cities there's all well, these guys do this, why, why do you do this? And should they try to, but again, what we were comfortable in on Abbotsford to making a policy, perhaps Langley wasn't. They may have other reasons, we don't know, because that's a discussion in their city. And this is probably the one that bugs you the most, then why that? <laughs> Now we are coming into more <coughs> from code end of it. What are the differences between a duplex and secondary suite? And we talked about a couple of things that, uh, you know, we remember that 90 square meter, the 40% and the legal entity, this will probably start making a little bit more sense. From a legal entity's point of view, duplex is independent real estate entity from a decent unit, can be subdivided or sold to independent unit. Stratified, you could do that with it. With a secondary suite, it's part of a adjacent unit as a single real estate entity cannot be, can't be subdivided or sold. <coughs> Size, it's sold in or duplex. You could have, uh, when I say no limit, let me qualify that. You still wanted to keep it on a part nine, you still wanted to keep it under 600 square meters, about 6,500 square feet or something for both duplexes, so 32 square feet, and I'm talking the ground level, so three floors of a duplex, 32 feet, it's a reasonable size, you can have one beside the other. <coughs> in, uh, in a suite side of it, you could have a 6,500 square foot one floor area, and you can have three floors of it, so, for all intents and purposes, your house could be about 19,000 square feet in total floor. That's permitted. Okay. <coughs> so, what the code says, fine, you can have that, but you're not going to build a suite more than 6 to 968 square feet. That's small. Okay. Then the next one comes in if, uh, if your house is 1,500 square feet. And uh, uh, two floors, you do about a 3,000, and maybe 1,200, say 24. So you try to, you, you will be limited by 40%. So the idea is here, the why they believe, why we believe that they did this, is it will become more apparent as we go further, is they're trying to keep the sec suites, secondary suites, they should be, or clear, clear on that, secondary suite is smaller relative to the house. So they're minor component of uh, primary building or primary house, either by maximum size or with the percentage of it. Are coach houses considered secondary suites or are they set different? Are they attached to the house? Uh, so you've got a garage, like in Vancouver, so yep. yep. and then you've got the coach house above the garage? Is yep. that that's an independent unit. Can't be What's sold. It? Can't be sold. It's no, the same. Yeah, it's not a real estate entity, but you, that's a land use matter. Vancouver decided that they will allow secondary suite in a house. Okay. Then they said, okay, fine, you can build another house, 
when at this time the garage will be on the bottom, the house will be on the top. So it's not a secondary suite, it's just different entity over yep. Because rather than having uh, <coughs> your garage attached to the main level, the lot was small enough, you just put a garage on the, uh, on the bottom and put a house on the top. <coughs> so why I use that terminology, no, it's not a secondary suite because it's not a part of another dwelling unit. Got a question though? Can the requirements could be uh, uh, could vary a bit. And again, municipality can decide if it's a garage or downstairs. We want you to do a little more than if you want to build a coach house. We want you to do a little bit more than what the coach says. They can do that up and probably for another six months. Then the code will sort of start coming in another new act where municipalities work to be permitted to adopt laws. Those are over, over and above the building code. So they're, they're not independent. They have maximum size to them. Now they're not, again, relative to the house, only certain portion can be. And uh, the ownership, independent, and the secondary suite, no. The guy that owns the house owns the suite, or owns that property, owns the whole thing, or just a tenant there. <coughs> Sometimes in Vancouver you see even three places. Vancouver can do that. Yeah. Vancouver can do that because Vancouver is not governed by uh, a community charter. Vancouver has, has its own charter and it allows the city of Vancouver, there's I think Winnipeg has it, San Francisco, there's a few cities in North America where Cities are old and they were built before any codes or any regulations. And if you were to start applying today's codes, or their socioeconomic needs are such that they wouldn't fit into the mold that's uh, outside of that city that was built 150 years ago. So Vancouver, under the charter, can allow that. They might have allowed it. I even I haven't looked at the Vancouver building plan. Because they're not governed by BC building codes. These requirements are coming from uh, so can a, a duplex have a secondary suite? In uh, Vancouver? No, like uh, anywhere on the road. No. no. Because duplex, remember when we looked at the definition, it's another one dwelling unit. The duplex has two, it's two units. Duplex. But it's a independent real estate. The, the duplex is, yes. the secondary suite isn't. Even though it's an independent unit, the building contains two units. Yeah. That's the definition when we're looking at a okay. building containing one dwelling unit. Okay. And we looked at the dwelling unit when we looked at the suite. So you, um, because <coughs> building is defined in the code as well. You call it floor, fourplex, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it exists. Yeah. But, but it's a fourplex, it's not, they're not legal suites. Yeah, you could, yeah, fourplex is fine. You could do fourplex, but the requirements for fourplex as you go further are other than the secondary suites will be different because we'll, we'll maybe try tying this 90 square meter 40% into it and see if that makes sense. Why did they dealt with the secondary suites in a certain way than the, or than the others? Okay. Now this will sort of start making a little bit more sense. Fire separation between the units. <coughs> For a duplex, 45 could be a one hour. Basically, five way type X drywall. If it's side by side, one unit goes up and down. Nothing goes through it, that's fine. If it's up and down, duplex again, you build that fire separation on the floor level, and there's two units independent of each other. <coughs> there's no real connection. One could be one person, the other could be other. In secondary suites, you can do 45 minutes or you can do, do, do 30 minutes, reduce it to 30 minutes if you would install additional smoke alarms. Photoelectric smoke alarms are within the suite or upstairs and uh, photoelectric are a little bit more sensitive to uh, to their environment and they don't, what I think what they call is they don't get used to their environment. If you have a habit of a burning toast, the ionized regular smoke alarm after a while will get <coughs> adjust to the ambience of the house. But photoelectric won't. Photoelectric, if it's set to go off at a certain 
uh, uh, air particle disturbance, it'll go off, regardless of what you do. And if you like burning toast and smoke alarm, like it will go off at that time. <clears throat> the other requirement is the no separation if a building is sprinkler. Same thing applies to secondary suites because the sprinkler systems are kind of provide you that protection and, and protects, it, it controls the fire at its incipient stage and so the other requirements really getting, having the passive fire separation code writers think it wasn't necessary. The next item now, this is where <coughs> you'll start seeing from probably this point on where it's a, uh, please stop me if you have a question anywhere. Uh, you'll start seeing the difference between the code requirements mm -hmm. for a secondary suite and a duplex. Fire separation for piping by piping, tubing, wiring, conduits, electrical outlets, etc. In, uh, in a duplex, they are either tightly fitted or the uh, fire stop with approved fire stopping uh, assembly. That's where you, the red caulking comes in, the uh, mineral wool comes in, and you pack it, fire caulk it, and that's where the duplex is. And uh, if, if it's combustible penetration, then you might need to put a donuts in the those who are in the plumbing end of it. And on the heating side of it, you go through, now you need to put a, even though the pipe comes out, goes up, you put a fire, if this is a fire separation, I will see a little picture further. You put a fire damper here, and you put a fire damper at the top. Because they, they're two separate uh, uh, fire separations, they want to have that treated properly. <coughs> but again, talking about tubing, piping, and this is all non combustible, if it's going through you, fire stop, and the sweet side of it, you can just make a tight fit, just mutter all that, that's it. Drain waste uh, vent uh, through walls. <coughs> there are plumbing pipes going through the wall assembly, and I'm presuming there's a side by side duplex, and you need to fire stop that. You need to fire stop in a duplex side of it, and in, uh, in a secondary suite side of it. It doesn't need to be fire stopped as long as the hole is not bigger than the, uh, the pipe itself. It's basically, in other words, tightly fitted. So the, what, the, what they're trying to now, we'll talk a little bit more about the 90, and, uh, 90 square meter, 968 square feet to a 40%. <clears throat> the fire load in a suite can't be more than 90 square meters because that's per minute by size. Okay. It's single entity, homeowner has somewhat control over what's going on. Homeowner can control the a secondary suite and the size is a smaller and you have a one outside door, your bedrooms have a, a windows, so if things go out of a hand you can easily get extracted out of that. As opposed to a duplex, it could be totally independent unit, God knows how big the other duplex is, and there's no connection between one to the other. If one duplex, then the next duplex there's no requirement for connecting the smoke alarm, so you may not know when it's, until it's too late when the next door duplex caught fire. And uh, but that's where the higher fire separation comes in because you, you don't need to be notified of that. But uh, but you do with the secondary suites because there's a smoke alarm connecting, and then that's where the, when we talk about additional smoke alarms, so suite and upstairs smoke alarm are connected. So idea is that something happens in a suite, you're upstairs, your alarm goes off, you try to get out because the secondary suite requirements for fire safety are not as much to the protection of a property as it is to the protection of a, a public. So get you out, hopefully within 10 minutes, fire department will be there and maybe they'll be able to save a half of the house or something. Okay. So that this is where you start seeing now Fire stop assembly here, no, the tightly fit of it is fine. And if you're going through the ceiling, and again, they're asking both to be a fire stop. And then the ceiling part is, as you all know, common sense, heat rises. So if you have a pipe going through a ceiling, you want to make sure that that gets remains contained, smoke remains contained, 
as the fire start, the, the temperature rises in the unit, the uh, <coughs> fire stopping, as you know, sort of start expanding and start closing all those holes of that you might have a pinhole or something. So that's sort of where uh, the uh, ceiling is. <coughs> ceiling is dealt with a little differently than the walls are. And if you have a hole here in the wall, you have a uh, fire up there by the time the smoke and fire both come to, say, within two, three, four, four feet of the wall. A lot of other things should have taken place by that. Any questions here so far? Is this for the whole load and or? This is, yep, outside of a Vancouver. Every, this is how it should be. Yeah. But most inspectors will ask you to fire stop all of them. In in big scheme of things, cost of a fire stopping to run a house. I mean, you already have a fire stopping too. You know, I mean, putting a few more of each of pocket around it. it just gives that a little extra comfort level. Are they in their rights? Probably not. But is it a bad thing? No. I mean, little things can go a long ways. And there was a study done a while back. Uh, a room. <coughs> I think it was 12 by 12 room, 8 foot ceiling, with a pinhole in the wall, can be filled with a smoke in 45 seconds with that pinhole. You pump the smoke on the other side. That's how fast the smoke gets into the room. So the fire stopping does, <coughs> keeps the smoke down, keeps the smoke contained, keeps the fire contained. That, that's where you see sometimes the building inspectors asking, yeah, yeah, it's your fire pump. And I would encourage you to continue to do it because it's a <coughs> in small item compared to what you can achieve with that. Question on the fire dampers, and maybe you haven't gotten there yet, but uh, so we're talking uh, fire flaps, if you like, and then the, the grills, and then the fire dampers on the return air as well. And we're coming to that. You're coming to yeah. that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Any questions on the plumbing end of it so far? So in Surrey, we did a secondary suite in the basement, and they had to put fire stop in between the joists where the dryer and the kitchen exhaust went out. And then in, in here, it says fire separation by piping, not required. <coughs> that thing, the piping is more in the plumbing piping end of it. Uh, the gas piping, the, those that the piping that you're referring to, that's in uh, the, the, the ducting. Yeah. That's a ducting. And there's also another part of the code says that you need to continue your fire separation. You can put a hole in it up to five square inches. Okay. Uh, 25. 25. 25. I think I was just trying. 25 square inches, about five by five, roughly. Uh, and I think it's about uh, the same size of around five. You can put that hole through it, but if it's bigger than that, then you want to continue your fire separation so the uh, lining up the joist comes in that way. Isn't there something else that says that you want to keep fire separation for all the time? You can put a light on it, that's oh, fine. Yeah. But once you put a, because inherently if you have a pot light, you have a hole in it, there's a, by the time you look at the whole assembly, it's really not a five inch hole left in it. It's really not a whole lot. There's a housing behind it. So there's other sort of a secondary components in the pot light. Thank you for bringing that up, but just for the clarification purposes. Uh, there's other secondary components that will make the fire stopping redundant as opposed to just a duct through it. Oh, that's a big hole. And uh, in, in, a, in a fire, we talked about a 45 minute rated assembly. <coughs> Assemblies are made out of your drywall, your uh, uh, two by tens, they both make it together as in an assembly. If you look at it, a five way drywall itself, I think it's about three minutes. Then we took a look at two by tens, they add about a 10 minutes into it, so that's where 45 comes in. But if you're just dealing with a if you cut a hole in your ceiling and it's under your ply, now uh, you're dealing with a, uh, only 40 minute reading and that's where the lining up the duct comes in. Thank you for raising that. Good.
this sort of a little illustration. This is strictly out of a code. And all these requirements that are, that are in the code, and, and uh, there is actually a bulletin on uh, building safety and the standards brand to website that sort of uh, talks about this too. Uh, and you know, I, once we are done, I can provide this uh, to uh, David to put it on your website. I'm fine with it because there's no proprietary information. It's all public. It's all for education purposes. So this is what <coughs> we're talking about when you have in on a secondary suite. This is purely dealing with a secondary suite. You have a half inch of drywall here. You have a combustible pipe in the wall system. It can come out. That's fine. But you can't do that because this is a ceiling because we need to protect it. A little bit more illustration. And code is sort of a saying that if uh, your combustible pipe, uh, drain waste vent pipe is behind drywall, there's a, some inherent fire separation there by the time the pipe sort of burns. And there's a few things, other things that need to happen. But the ceiling is dealt differently for the, from the pure uh, nature of a fire and how heat rises. So we want to make sure that that remains protected. That's why they're trying to come here and say uh, that when you do this, this is not permitted. So then you need to do something here. And that something comes in in many, many forms. You can come and just box it. Now it's behind drywall. It's good. Or you can put those donors in it. They're permitted. That's up. Uh, rated assembly or tested assembly or tested product for that uh, purpose. Now the furnace venting, like the plastic PVC pipe that goes outside, is it treated, treated the same way? If it comes out here, goes out, as long as it's in the, it's in the uh, uh, wall assembly, behind drywall, it's fine. It can come out of the wall assembly as long as it's tightly fitted. The only place it can come out is your, uh, is your ceiling. So if you have this pipe comes out here, this is your floor system, goes out, out say your uh, floor area, uh, uh, your uh, uh, high efficiency furnaces, and they have uh, the condensation pipes, you take them out, put them out, that's fine. Because they're out. The only time they become an issue is because they're going through the ceiling. And if a furnace is not, a furnace room isn't fire rated, then there's a few other things. Okay. <coughs> Make sense, kind of? So they would have to drive on like fire separation in the joist for the furnace venting? If you're going through the, if, if you're penetrating the fire separation in the ceiling. It depends yeah, on where your furnace room is. If it's part of the house, then sure. I mean, we have unfinished basements. They're, they're legal, they're permitted, because their idea is that it's your house and you have sort of a control over what's going on in your house. If you, there's not doors that keep it smoke and or fire or room is out. So if the furnace room is part of the house, then it can go wherever they need to go. If the furnace room is a part of the suite, now you have a bit of a problem. So now you need to sort of either fire stop at the ceiling level or uh, fire stop the whole furnace room around with a rated door, self closure, drywall on both sides, fire stops anything goes into the walls if it's bigger than uh, the pipes or the ducting and so on and so forth. That's sort of a, uh, making sense? Kind of? penetrating fire separation and serving only one unit. And I highlighted the word only one unit, meaning you have a duplex and it's my up and down duplex and then underneath it. As long as I'm not going through fire separation, I'm fine with it. Take it on a secondary in the duplex side of it, my furnace serving my unit, but that goes up into the joy space, comes down, into the damper. So that's the common way that we do. We just fire stop it, then we run with the chase. Now they're actually in this side of the bottom side of the fire separation. That's why you don't see fire dampers and duplexes. But if you would design it in a certain way, then you can. 
ducts penetrating fire separation serving only one unit. And secondary type uh, part of it, the fire dampers are removed. Immediately after this, the code talks about 932, code talks about 936, and says that the secondary suite need to be treated like other dwelling unit. There's no special requirements for this no relaxations, zero relaxations, other than some of these fire damper requirements. Okay. And uh, it, it says that when we go into 932, in a duplex only if it serves a one <coughs> unit, otherwise part six. So basically engineered system. If it's one uh, heating system serving two duplexes, it should be designed under part six of the code. In secondary suite side of it, it's okay. Because the idea is that it's a small, not more than 968 square meters or 40% of the floor area, and you sort of have a control over it's your own house. You have a little bit more flexibility <coughs> and, and control what's going on in your house. So it, the requirement from the suite, uh, 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 the, from the ventilation end of it, it's permitted, but must prevent circulation of, uh, of a smoke between units. Fire dampers don't prevent smoke. Pardon? Fire dampers don't prevent smoke. Nope. <coughs> That's why they added that term. The smoke, smoke dampers, so the That's right. That's right. They don't. No, the fire dampers do not. Fire dampers are by nature the fusible link, and I don't need to tell you guys this, you know a lot more about it than I do. I mean, there's a fusible link, it goes at 185 degree Fahrenheit, and I think and it just closes, but 185 degree Fahrenheit is it's pretty warm. Yep, by, the, by that time there's a lot of smoke going through, but that's why the, the, in the secondary suite side of it, code is saying, permitted when it must prevent circulation of a smoke between units. So how do you prevent that? Yeah. Yeah, Manji, one of the things that brought this to attention and asking you to speak here is there's a certain market push. If a person's got a hot water heated house, a secondary suite below, and it happens to go the HRV route, what would prevent someone and yet being totally compliant with these requirements of using one HRV, which cannot recirculate smoke, and having it distribute fresh air to the bedrooms of both dwelling units and exhausting from the bathrooms of both dwelling units, would not just that piece, of that piece of equipment essentially meet that requirement of not being stipulating smoke between the units? That requirement, as long as in both heating and air conditioning, HRV could do that, and in the ventilation. If, you know, not, if it was independently ducted, see, then yep. it would not have a recirculating ability. Absolutely. What about ones with recirculating defrost, though? Well, here you wouldn't need it. It's built into the unit, though. I mean, the defrost shouldn't come on, but the, a lot of units don't have a fifth port, right? They just have a damper that flips over and recirculates the... It's going to be a defrost is going to come on. You cut the power. Right? Cut the power, the damper's closed. So you could use the same device that you use to cut the power on the furnace, right, that runs off the smoke detectors. Yeah, those dampers are 100% though. Are yeah, they are. are they? Oh, yeah, they're, they're big, thick, big, thick Armaflex foam on the window. Well, I, I can't speak for every manufacturer, but yes, the ones I'm thinking of. Yeah. Some have a fifth port, right? And they, I, I, I can't say what they would use either, whether they close normally open or normally close. So the issue with ventilation then is smoke. Prevent circulation of the smoke between units. If you can demonstrate that. Depends. Yeah, but your smoke alarm is going to shut your furnace off, which is going to stop smoke, right? So your fire is big enough, your fire damp is going to close, which is going to stop. How would you, how would your furnace shut down? Smoke alarm. Those fire air relays, those same relays that Abbotsford mandated, which you can actually disconnect the power to the appliance, that would actually stop the fan from running. It's only in an Abbotsford. No. no, but that device is available. Yeah. You could the, use that what, device to do that, you, though, no? The, the code doesn't, yeah, even no today's idea. code doesn't permit it, but it says that you need to have a duct type smoke detector. Duct mounted, I believe. Oh. Duct sensing. Oh. So Langley yeah. has to use a duct mounted smoke detector. Oh, that's and, 
Personally, this is my personal opinion, it has nothing to do with the BOVC, nothing to do with other building inspections. I am uncomfortable with the duct mounted smoke detectors. Well, only works in the first No, because there's other reasons. The duct mounted smoke detectors were driven out of a commercial applications or where there is a in, in a in a larger applications, they're part of a fire alarm system. And a fire alarm system uh, requires that you have an annual regular maintenance. Annual regular maintenance is that every so often someone will come and take the uh, access hatch and clean the smoke detector and take the lint off and, and put it back together on a regular basis. In your single family home, there's no fire alarm system. How would a homeowner, fourth, fifth, sixth homeowner would know that I have a duct type smoke detector, duct mounted smoke detector that I need to clean, let alone changing batteries on your smoke detector. Well, you can't even you know, change your filter once a month. <laughs> <laughs> because it, it's one of those things that, in the, and we were talking on that table, the yeah. thing is that if you don't see them, how do you know that they need something? I mean, from a, a smoke alarm's point of view, the drive to please keep your smoke alarm plugs change your batteries every 10 years if they're battery operated, test them. After 15 years, your smoke alarm should be replaced because that's what the manufacturers say. When we go visit on social visits, go to homes, and then you see they're sitting, why? Well, we were making, you know, frying something, this goddamn thing keeps going off, and you got rid of it. What is it? I don't know, it's just noisy, it's annoying. So that's personally, I'm uncomfortable with, because of the, the maintenance reasons, I'm uncomfortable with duct mounted. That's why when we looked at the model in Abbotsford, that it's almost foolproof. You want to disconnect your smoke alarm, that's fine. That's your choice. You're making a conscientious choice. If the system doesn't function the, the way it's designed and installed, that's fine. But there's nothing you really need to do if you leave it alone for it to function as it is. That's why I qualified that. That's an average device solution. I, I would prefer that over a duct mounted smoke alarm because now I don't have to do anything. I don't have to know anything about it. The, uh, the relay switch is, is, won't fail. When it does fail, I'll find out. Because my Burn it'll, stop work. Yeah. it'll stop working, and that'll force me to do something. So, but going back to the, uh, if you can keep smoke out of it, and uh, the question on the fire dampers, if you're penetrating a fire separation, yes, you need to put on a fire damper. Because fire dampers are <clears throat> to property protection. In 97, 98, 99, for those three years when Abbotsford brought the secondary suites, I was asked by the department to uh, administer that program. And I used to carry a, a boot, a fire damper, fire caulking, mineral wool in my car. Because I was dealing with homeowners, I wasn't going to teach them what the code says, well, do you do this, and they, I tell them a fire damper, they said, why would I dump a fire here? Why do I need that? And I had that question asked a couple, three times. Then I like bought a fire damp, put boot in it and everything. I said, this is what it looks like. You do this and this and this. You do this, then you're good. Oh, that's all it, oh yeah, that's it. I can, I can handle that. The, we used to specify four by 10 fire dampers. Uh, you, could, you could buy three by nine. Those are the standard boots that you'll find in most homes or some older homes. But by the time you look at the housing of the fire damper, you look at the shutter that takes it, the left about the half of an inch, maybe three quarter at the best. The airspace, uh, uh, three quarter by maybe about eight inches. 
So we mandated that you make your boot bigger, but 4 by 10, and you have some air coming through the units. I think the point he was getting at is if you want to have five I have a question on that. Maybe you can educate me on this. <clears throat> Let's go to a commercial application for a moment. <clears throat> you have a fire separation between two. There's a transfer grill. That's your plenum transfer grill. You cut a hole, put your boot, put a fire damper on. There's nothing around it. It's wide open on this side, wide open on that side. Just a door lying on that fusible link. So the, the only time the duct uh, uh, gauge comes into play. There's a time in on the code where it says 750 degree, and I think uh, there's a gauge. I believe it's it translates into 16 gauge uh, 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 sheet metal, and 750 is really, and I think it's a it's a stainless steel. If you have that duct, you don't need a fire damper. But the fire damper itself, if it's mounted in an assembly, uh, in in a ceiling assembly, if you would. Just by again one of the, the inherent application in two by ten floors uh, in the floor joist, you're probably closer to one side of the joist or the other. You put a one yeah, screw through it. Flashed, now that sort of a keeps it together, regardless of what kind of a duct you have with it. Fire damper has to go on it. Uh, if it's a 22 gauge sleeve, right? And it has to be a quick disconnect. Yeah. Right. You can't do that. Ah, uh, no. No, you can't. So it's not we won't quick disconnect it. It's better to be disconnected from the system. Right. But when you're looking at again going back to the uh, to the Which issues of a secondary suite in a commercial application because they weren't designed for housing. They weren't designed for secondary suites and they just came into secondary suites. And in order for them to be in twenty two gauge again, you're on a wall system, there's nothing around for you to mount it. Now you need some sort of a sleeve where you can mount your uh, fire damper to. So it's there. It doesn't fall off with, uh, with the, your screws falling through the drywall. Yeah, the 30 gauge belt is going to melt before the fire damper Yep. Oh, no, but, but I don't know about that. But the duct, but the fire damper also, in, in a in inherently 16 inch on center, you have a 9 inch, and generally speaking, it's either one side or the other or somewhere. You put a one screw through it. Is it 100% compliance? Probably not. Would it remain in place? Most likely it will. Because again, it's not there to stop a fire for 45 minutes. In urban settings, you should have a fire department there in about less than 10 yes. minutes. That's a mandate in the code. Pardon? Just to buy your time. Just buy your time. The only reason for you to have that 10 minutes. Technically, purely technically, absolutely you're correct. But again, when you look at it, how we build homes and what we do and what are the <coughs> other things into play, small unit, how much fire you can have, it usually works. And, uh, uh, 2001 or two <clears throat> had a fire in uh, uh, arson fire in one of the homes with a secondary suite. There's a family dispute. Husband, I believe, was a, uh, alleged to be that he set the house with the suite on a fire. Fire dampers work. Uh, the the furnace work. The only damage by the time fire department, this was accelerant fire. <clears throat> the only damage in the, in the house side of a door was just where the the uh, cell was, and probably three, four feet of the floor got melted. That's it. it wasn't a smoke damage, all got contained. Does it say it works all the cases? No. But that's one example where we thought, well, it does work. Now, the city of London used to accept the uh, heat runs and return areas if it was lower than uh, 12 inches of floor 12, level. 24 inches from the floor. Yeah. 
below your knee height. So is that still in effect or no more? That's it thing because the idea of is <clears throat> anything below knee height is that's a similar requirement that we had in an Abbotsford and when I came to Langley and put that in a place too. Uh, the idea of uh, not requiring ducts and on a wall, common wall, the fire rated walls, if they're within 24 inches on the floor, is by that time, if you have, I mean, if you have an arson fire, there's lots of things could go wrong with it. There's, houses aren't designed for that. Houses are that something happens and now it's just going on. There's no accelerant, it's just a regular fuel load that you have in your house. You have your furniture, you have your carpet, your drapery. Uh, your toys and everything else. By the time the smoke comes down, by the time there's enough heat that comes to where you need something out of 24 inches, there's a lot of other things that have happened. And it's generally more than 10 minutes of time. That's why when we, because again, that requirement came from Abbotsford, uh, and we made a decision that why 24 inches because of those uh, uh, other items. So now the, that, that is only in the city of Langley and Abbotsford or everywhere? I think it's in most places, I believe. But I know Langley City yeah. and I know Abbotsford okay. if they haven't changed it yet. <laughs> what was the question regarding this knee height? The question was <clears throat> the return air ducts not requiring a fire damper if they're within 24 inches of a floor, finished floor. Yeah. and. Uh, in that idea was that if the fire damper need to work at that stage, there's a lot of, there's a raging fire. Yeah. And sure. the raging fire by that time, the alarm should have gone off, someone would have called 911, the fire department should be there less than 10 minutes. Is that just for return or supply also? Any doctor talks about this. And we had had people that said, okay, well, can I lower my duct down? I said, absolutely. Yeah. Would it work mechanically? We'll let the mechanical contractor decide. And if you can bring it within 24 inches, that's fine. Because again, mm -hmm. remember that diagram where we had going through the wall was fine, but not the ceiling? Mm -hmm. Because wall, again, even if it's higher height, as the code said, the code recognizes that you're not going to get as big of an impact on a wall as you would have on of making sense or getting confusing? Yeah. Huh? <coughs> it's getting confusing that I'm achieving what I was supposed to achieve. <laughs> <laughs> and the same in the heating ventilation side of it, what it says is that that penetrating, provided that you meet 932, 933, circulation of the smoke. Is that answering questions? Some of making it a little bit clear what the requirements will be should be. Okay. Was the uh, sorry, um, <laughs> earlier talked about the penetrations where you had less than 25 square inches? Uh, did I understand correctly to say that that not required? <clears throat> and I was corrected on that. Thank you. Uh, the <clears throat> 25 square inch opening. Uh, if it's not ducted, doesn't need a fire damper, meaning pot lights basically are permitted. Okay, if it's not ducted. If it's not ducted. If it's ducted, what they do is then either you can put a fire damper on or you can line your floor choice. Because you have a, and again, this is sort of the theory works. You have a drywall coming in, you create a hole, drywall sort of travels up, comes down. Now the drywall is giving you that 45 minutes rate. And you have a plywood behind it. <coughs> before it burns a hole through that, again, there's a lot of other things that need to happen. Because if you just left that hole and fire happens to be that area, uh, plywood is designed for about five minutes. If exposed to fire, it'll, uh, five it will burn in about five minutes, even if it's a surface burning, and you'll have a hole through it. So when you sort of wrap it around, so you see, like, uh, that's, uh, I guess the, with the 24 inches came in uh, a little bit more confusing for the building inspectors when the new code come into effect. Uh, we were bringing in fresh air to secondary suites, which was heated by electric uh, baseboard, 
and they wanted to take the fresh air down to about 24 inches high. And in our ventilation checklist, it clearly clarifies that the fresh air vent should be six feet or higher up. And we're just trying to save you 50 bucks. <laughs> That's normally the cost of a fire damper. I think those are round ones are a little bit more expensive than uh, these uh, the rectangular ones. If I remember correctly, but again, I haven't checked the price on those. But the fresh air, if it just comes straight from outside, <coughs> dedicated to the, let's say, secondary suite living room, it, it doesn't require a damper. It, it's not a, uh, you can either do a damper or you can line the floor, uh, uh, floor joist with a drawer. In most cases, they line the floor joist with a drywall because the drywaller is there anyways. Renji, I'm um, just thinking right now, I wonder if I should backtrack a bit regarding questions. Roughly how much time do you have here? I know some people have to be at work tomorrow, 6.30, things like that. Um, I'm a one of those people now. Okay, yeah, you're on the <laughs> side too. time-wise, I am... I will be here till the last person decided to leave here, then I'll pack up my right stuff. right now, for the benefit of those who have to leave, roughly how much time would you like if we don't interrupt you with questions? I think we have a probably one or more, two more slides oh, left. Okay, okay. One or two slides left. Right. But I want to, like, this is where the crux of the, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any slide after. Uh, that is the last slide. And the next one is coming for the questions anyways. I understand fire flaps aren't allowed. Fire flaps are only permitted in certain applications, but they're not considered as a fire, uh, the fire dampers. Commercially, certain in certain applications. applications. Because they're, again, depending on where they are, and what purpose they're serving. Yeah. They're, they're, they're specific, uh, because in the, in the commercial side of it, you have... They still have another fire stop. There's a the few stop. other things are part of that assembly. So <clears throat> when we try looking at it on a component and try putting that component somewhere else, then we say, well, I did it there, it was fine, but not here. That component is designed for a specific purpose. And there's other components behind it that will make that whole thing work. Yeah, that whole thing with secondary suites is pretty loose uh, all over the place. So it's, uh, in my view, the best thing you can do is put a separate system in and be done with it. If you can, yes. I a wholesaler. No, from experience too. I, I, I had a house with a suite in it, and uh, you know when you when you have a common system heating, you're always smelling with guys cooking downstairs, yep. and vice versa. Those mm -hmm. those are really annoying things. Not yep. only not to mention sound crap as well. You went into the wrong tenant, Paul. <laughs> it's difficult. The, it's difficult to heat I didn't both put that, spaces I didn't put that. properly with a single system too. Though right. it's, it's really difficult to do that. They're not designed to work. Uh, off of two thermostats, they're not designed. I mean, there's lots of things you can do, but like, it, it is a lot more difficult to pull it off. It's more the retro, though. You know, yeah. like people making stuff, you know, right? Yep. You know, like when you build doesn't have, it's a lack of, they're not. And, and don't forget, our, sometimes our mechanic is underneath the stairs, like it's a, for a small closet, you know. Like two systems not going to be there. There are solutions to everything. Going back to your comment about uh, <coughs> sound, and I think it was came from a floor. There's, if you're within, uh, uh, between duplexes, between two dwelling units, other than a secondary suite, there's a sound requirements included. You need to have STC 55, I believe. However, not in a secondary suite. Because again, it's thought behind it is that you're making a choice. It's, it's a social issue that you don't like smelling curry. Well, <laughs> don't print it to curry people. <laughs> 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 I don't know if legally you can do that or not. Or do that. Yep. <coughs> yep. And and that's that's precisely. I mean, that's what the code wants it to be. But secondary suite regulations are written for 
re uh, retrofits and also new ones and talks about gives you enough of that if you want to build a new one you should do this way but what I have in most cases you get a radiant heating system and a fresh air supply here and there that sort of a take care of that issue or you have a uh, electrical heating system in a suite you throw a couple of baseboards you're good with it so for a fireplace in a living room you're fine you're providing what you need to provide again these are Flexibility is built to keep, again, affordability and the fit Most of these pleasure to have you. I thank you for bringing this because so often we don't get straight answers to the questions that all of you have asked tonight. And thinking one step further, um, I know there will be many questions come from an audience like this. With you having resigned from the position of the public sector and going private, so we're not badgering you, is there someone within your association that you deem to be a reasonably qualified person in these kind of areas that we could go to in the future for questions that individuals jobs I'm still continuing with my position with the association all right uh, my term is ending in 2018 yes uh, you have been a part of the association as long as I can remember and uh, <clears throat> and uh, from that point of view if you would approach the association association someone from association will be happy to come out and we're have a that discussion because we, we truly appreciate as board of uh, the executive committee of your sport and continue sport and education because our members look forward to your presentations. So if there's anything we can do to help, it's an honor. It's an honor to have you here and on behalf of all of us, thank you very much, Manji. It was going to say 